Okay, uh, so in at Wampanoag, and, um, and you know, my African tribal ancestry was robbed from us a long time ago, so I can't even, I'm gonna talk about tribal identities in an African perspective too. And then, you know, the colonizers got their genes in there too, you know, Scottish and French and possibly others. Okay. All right. That's Thank good you. enough. All right. Thank you for coming. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I'm glad to see you again. Okay. Well, good to be here. Good to see you. i got a special place in my heart for the Salish and Kootenai people who taught me how to teach, you know, I'd say 33 years ago. Um, a whole new world opened up to me when I moved here and uh, all kinds of connections with my own identity, with the natural world, all kinds of good things. And uh, I imagine some of you folks might even be the children of my students at Two Eagle River School back in the 1980s and uh, early 90s. And I'm thankful to all of them, even the ones that uh, try to give me a hard time. No, they are joking all the time. I learned the value of joking and all that here too. Lots of good things. So I'm uh, like um, Heather was saying of diverse ancestries, urban raised, uh, Native and African, Wampanoag, Choctaw, African, French, and all the rest. I, and uh, did not have the um, privilege, honor, to be raised in the traditional indigenous way. I had to learn later in life on my own. Um, I started teaching when I was 33, 33 years ago. And this is my last semester coming up. I'm going to graduate and just uh, not graduate. What do they call that? Retire. <laughs> it's kind of the same thing. It's, there's some similarities there. And, uh, now, retire is winding down. But I have all kinds of work I want to do and farm. And I'm in the food sovereignty movement, which I may talk about at the end. Because this is going to be connecting a lot of things. And um, you'll see, uh, get a lot of information. Um, but it's a lot of what you are going to hear will make you wonder, uh, how much BS have I been taught all my life? You know, is there anything trustworthy in the general knowledge and education uh, world, especially about our history? history of indigenous peoples, our identity, as we get it filtered back to us from people who have no idea who we really are, teaching American history and Native American studies and all of that. Uh, how much have we taken in that we might want to discard someday and replace with, with good knowledge and, and meaningful knowledge that will guide us forward? into a good path. So the first thing I want to talk about is um, the human race's history with indigeneity. And it's everybody's history. We didn't start out being uh, off balance and uh, excessive in consumption and technology and all that. If you take what most scientists say, and the, all of this is up for question, you know. Modern man, as they used to call them, modern humans, post-Neanderthal, about 200,000 years. So and this is a debatable figure. Uh, we could waste time debating that, but let's just say that's pretty generally accepted. And, you know, there's all kinds of debate about how human the Neanderthals were and all of that. Okay. But if it is this, and it could be a lot longer than 200,000, it could be somewhat less. That's what, what we know as modern uh, 
mega society, unsustainable society, human life, is only 2.5% of our entire human history. In other words, the last 5,000 years is not normal to live in societies that exceed the carrying capacity of your ecosystems, to live in disrespect to our common mother and disjointed and individualistic and not thinking of our connections is only about 2.5% of human history. All humans used to know better, used to live better. And I would like to suggest that there's no reason why we cannot return to what really matters in connection to life on Earth while we still can. You know, and uh, so with that said, we talk about the indigenous peoples of Africa and America and how they came together. And this whole talk will talk about resistance, as I said in the information I sent to Heather, that these various indiv indigenous tribal peoples of Africa and America had to engage in some sort of resistance just to survive in this colonialist scenario. Okay, and if you can't see all of this, I'm gonna just read this before I go to the next slide. So 12,500 years ago is where horticulture, which is natural uh, cultivation of crops, is not agriculture, because agriculture is growing crops for something called money. And money doesn't come into the picture until less than 5,000 years ago, maybe 4,500 years. We've been having this artificial uh, imaginary wealth thing called money that's got everybody under its thumb and working for the man and all of that. Okay. And so before people grew crops for money or even for trade or barter, they were growing for their people and just enough to feed everybody in the community. And that was the indigenous cultivation and they supplemented it with gathering the wild foods and they would grow the crops side by side with the wild crops. And there was not this idea you exterminate nature to replace it with your cultivated uh, better idea the hubris of colonial society is incredible. They think they've got a better idea than Mother Nature. Gosh, you know, it just boggles the mind when you really think about it. So, that's the part you couldn't read there. And any uh, Daniel Quinn fans who think that it all went wrong when we first planted seeds, I'd like to talk to you later. But uh, it was a certain form of cultivation. A disrespectful form of cultivation is where a lot went wrong. But growing crops in harmony with Mother Nature and to fit into an ecosystem that already existed was not harmful. It was sustainable. A supplemental activity part of our responsibility as humans, as many tribal societies belief systems say, we were here to be caretakers, help take care of life on Earth. Not to rule over it, but to keep a good thing going. The natural systems. We can improve on these natural systems. Um, we can work with them and supplement them and all of that. So, um, real quickly now, um, the, pe the indigenous people who were captured, kidnapped from their homes, from their uh, farms and their communities and their villages and brought to America and forced to become slaves in a human trafficking system, 
They did not call themselves Africans. Most of them never even heard of that word. Identity concepts. Um, they're from, the people who were captured are from a little area of West Central Africa, uh, extending out to most remotely to about that far. And uh, they didn't represent this entire continent. There's thousands of tribal nations. I've heard estimates between 1,500 and 3,000 tribal nations in Africa, the continent. That's a, a Roman name forced upon people. Uh, this is your continent called Africa. We're, we're going to call you people Africans. You could see it. And so we're going to look at some of the real tribal names now. This map is too uh, hard for you to read from your distance, but uh, I can send you a copy of this. And this is just a sampling of some of the names, uh, Asante, Fulani, um, Igbo. These are real identities, tribal identities, Akan, uh, Mende, and um, all of the names you see here. I'm going to show you some more with pictures. Here's the Krobo girls, young women coming of age. And you can see by these photographs, this is still going on. They still have their indigenous coming of age ceremonies in many places. A lot of us, and I know our Wampanoag people don't have that anymore. And uh, m many people don't have the, the young man ceremony, the young woman ceremony. But uh, the indigenous people who survive in Africa today Many of them, the more remote ones, the ones that aren't messing around trying to join colonialist society and live in the city and all of that, still have it. Okay. All that was stolen from us who now are called African Americans, there are people back there who still have that. And uh, so I'm not going to go on and on about the importance of coming of age ceremonies, but I will say that this was a way that people had their security about their future and their belonging to the community and the community having their back through all the teachings at the coming of age ceremonies. It was one of the most important ceremonies of indigenous people everywhere. That's how you got a good start on the good road besides hearing the stories growing up. And then you enter into adulthood as a story bearer and a teacher yourself. The essential time and, and all of the young people in indigenous societies worldwide who still have this look forward with great joyous expectation to their turn to come into the uh, adult community as they've seen their older cousins and brothers and sisters make that transition. And so that was robbed from Many people, Basari, people of uh, western, closer to the coastal West Africa, Senegal. <laughs> really quickly, I know I'm going to be tempted. I have so many slides, I'm going to be tempted to go over time, but I'm not. Okay, they, they proved themselves, the young men, about 14, 15 years old, by wrestling this giant, and his name... Odukuta, also called Lukuta. And you can see he comes out into the ceremonial grounds with this gigantic headdress. And they, and they use one of the biggest and strongest men in the tribe, and you can, his head's there. And, and then he takes that off, and he has a smaller headdress, and he starts wrestling with the, the young man. And uh, if the young Man gives it all he's got and shows courage and fortitude and a uh, little strength. And towards the end, the, the giant figure, Lukuta, lets him win, you know. And that's part of the initiation ceremony. Other ones, the Yoruba people of uh, 
Benin and Nig Nigeria. That's another thing about colonialism. They go into some people's homelands and create states and boundaries and nation states. And often the borders go right through a tribe's homeland. So now you're under two jurisdictions, one nation here and one there. Hasn't that not happened all over the U.S.? Uh, Tohono O'odham in Arizona and Mexico, uh, Blackfeet in Canada and the U.S. Because these colonialists just put their borders right through people's homes. And, and so that happened with the Yoruba people over there. This is a honoring the mother ceremony and lots of elaborate effort and time goes into uh, the costumes uh, that represent the different spirit beings and all of that. And um, one of the things you'll see in all of these pictures is that people have a lot of time to put into culture and they're not starving and they don't look sick. Like all of the propaganda you get about Africa, and anytime you see anything on TV about Africa, it's people fighting or starving or sick. That's intentional. It's a long chain of propagandizing for white supremacy. It goes back to the colonial era. It's a habit they have not been able to break because it provides them some kind of sense of security uh, to create this negative images about people of color. And so uh, I just wanted to show you a s similarity in ceremonial uh, outfits and uh, praying, dancing, all of that between uh, certain uh, tribal people in Africa and in America and uh, similar headdresses, designs, Here's the Dogon people. I had a, a good fortune of having a Dogon student uh, from Ghana in one of my classes in the intro to NAS. And throughout the semester, after she got up her courage to come talk to me, you know, she says, you know, what you're talking about, that's the way we believe too. You know, why are we surprised by that? The first ways being in harmony with one earth and many different ecosystems. And you can see uh, similarities in the Pueblo culture there, similarities in architecture, green architecture, truly green uh, architecture. You know, you don't need a big mansion made out of glass and all <laughs> crazy stuff. Okay. And now they're catching on to this idea of tiny houses. We've been doing that for thousands and thousands of years. And they think, oh, we got something here. They always do that. I don't know why. OK. Uh, excuse me. i got to put a leash on here and stick to the business. But this, this is a classic style of roof shingles. Uh, the, the old uh, medieval Europeans had uh, grass thatch shingles and uh, islanders, Pacific Islanders, indigenous Americans in the southern plains, where we, the Kansa people who 